Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis, I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and vice chair of the Norbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, August 21st, and we will hear the presentation, Best Practices and Lessons Learned for Sustainable Comprehensive Planning. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number that's bolded. Uh, for content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And um, for your questions, just to help me out, be sure to indicate uh, which one of our panelists the question goes with. And then we will answer all the questions uh, at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today's webcast in particular is sponsored by the Sustainable Communities Division. To learn more about all of APA's divisions, including sustainable communities, you can just visit planning.org slash divisions to learn about our chapters, planning.org slash chapters. And uh, on your screen is a list of our upcoming sessions. Um, two of them are, are planned. They're in the works. We just have to submit them for CM credit, which we'll be doing this afternoon. So be sure to check back uh, for a complete listing of all of our webcasts, including these two that are coming soon this afternoon. You can, uh, you can reach out at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to see those. Okay. Uh, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just go to planning.org, sign in, go to your dashboard, and then select activities by provider. And again, today's provider is the Sustainable Communities Division. And then uh, you can click on today's session title. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some of our recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. For availability of our distance education sessions, just again check our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcasts. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information uh, on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just head to YouTube and either uh, type in planning webcast in the search or youtube.com slash planning webcast. And we will also have a PDF of the presentation after the session is over, again, on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And be sure to scroll down to the bottom of the page. Uh, at the top of the page is the, our calendar. And if you click on that link, it's, it's just to our GoToWebinar. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see another header that, that says our, our, these are the PDF sessions. Uh, so be sure to click down there to get the PDF. Okay, um, so next I'm going to turn it over to Gen Jennifer Koch. Uh, she is the Secretary Treasurer of the Sustainable Communities Division and um, by trade she is a planner with Roadside Harwell in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jenny to get us started today. All right. Okay, thanks, Christine. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of the division. Um, the Sustainable Communities Division aims to support planners who are working to integrate all aspects of sustainability into their work. And uh, so one way we do that is by coordinating a series of webinars, uh, including this one, through the planning webcast series um, and various venues. Uh, we have a couple of webinars coming up in September, uh, not to spoil it before it comes up on the planning webcast series, but we have a September 18th webinar uh, coming up through the planning webcast series that will uh, involve a speaker from the UK who will talk about some award-winning projects um, that revolve around sustainability and communities. And we'll also have one of our division award winners speaking on that 
uh, webinar. And then on September 2nd, uh, a little sooner, we'll have um, one of our sustainability champions is going to be speaking on a webinar about um, nonprofit partners and tools for building strong communities. So um, you can you can register at those links, or um, if you're on our e-bulletin, we'll be sending out information uh, via the bulletin. So thanks to our uh, sponsors for this year, we have um, Dewberry, Far Associates, ICLE, Lehigh Valley Planning Commission, My Sidewalk, Niche Engineering, VHB, WRT, Clarion, Tesca, and USGBC on board. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, the division has, uh, you know, we have a webinar series, but we also have several ongoing initiatives. So you can learn more about those on our website and the various social media outlets. Uh, if you want to sign up for our bi-weekly e-bulletin, you can do so on the blog. Um, and just uh, send us an email if you have any webinar ideas or other ideas, or if you want to volunteer, we're always looking for more hands on deck. Uh, so I'll just briefly introduce today's topic and speakers. So as you know, the purpose of the webinar today is to discuss the central role of comprehensive plans in creating sustainable communities and to share a set of best practices and experiences with planning at the local level. So starting out the webinar will be David Rouse, who has over 30 years of experience in community planning, design, and implementation uh, as the current Managing Director of Research and Advisory Services for APA. He oversees APA's Planning Advisory Service and National Centers for Planning. Uh, he played a, a key role in the Sustaining Places initiative, and today he'll give us an overview of the um, PAS report and the standards within and some emerging trends in comprehensive plans. Uh, joining David are Patrice Carroll from the City of Seattle and Matthew Dugan from the City of Austin. Uh, and as representatives from communities who help to develop and test the Sustaining Places comprehensive plan standards and scoring system, they're going to share their experiences and lessons learned. Um, so Patrice is a senior planner for the City of Seattle, Department of Planning and Development. She's the project manage manager for Seattle 2035, which is the 10-year update of the city's comprehensive plan, which is currently in process. Um, and Matt is a planner for the city of Austin, planning and zoning department. And he worked on Imagine Austin, which is the, uh, Austin's most recent comprehensive plan. And he's now working on implementing the plan. So they'll speak to their uh, experiences with planning and implementation. Uh, so with that, I will just get this started and transfer over to David. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jenny. See if I can call up my PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, as Jenny was saying, I, I'm, I've been involved in APA Sustaining Places Initiative going back about five years now. And so I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview of the uh, initiative, particularly with the uh, PAS report, which uh, APA published this, earlier this year, which establishes guidance uh, for integrating sustainability in a comprehensive plan. So we refer to that, refer to this guidance as the Comprehensive Plan Standards for Sustaining Places. So that's mainly what I'm going to cover in, in my time here. Uh, start with just a little bit of background on the Sustaining Places Initiative. It was announced uh, by APA actually back in 2010 at the World Urban Forum. And as it evolved, really focused on looking at the role of the local governmental comprehensive plan in integrating sustainability into human settlement. And there's a task force that was established that I was a, a, an original member of going back around 2010, 2011. Uh, who developed overall guidance, and there was an earlier PAS report uh, published that you may have seen. And then a working group uh, developed more specific standards and best practices for comprehensive plans. And from the fall of 2013 through the 2014 National Planning Conference in Atlanta, uh, as I now as research director uh, for APA, we tested these standards that the working group developed with 10 pilot communities that were in the middle of comprehensive planning processes. So you'll see these pilot communities here. They varied, var they varied widely in terms of the size, the types of jurisdiction, where they were located in the country. 
And we also uh, enlisted the help of three other communities who had completed comprehensive plans. Austin was one, and Raleigh and, and Norfolk, Virginia were the others, to test the standards and the scoring system I, I'll, I'll talk about. So that's a little bit of background. And the wor work of the pilot communities, as well as the completed set of standards, uh, and, uh, is contained in this um, uh, PS report, which we call Sustaining Places Best Practices for Comprehensive Plans. And I'm going to get into the standards. I'm not going to go through them all in detail, but I'm going to give you hopefully a good flavor of them. But first, I just wanted to point out another thing that the, uh, we did in our PS report, which I co-wrote with, uh, with uh, David Gottschalk from University of uh, North Carolina, Ch uh, Chapel Hill, was look at some emerging trends in terms of the state of practice in the 21st century in comprehensive planning. So you'll see five or six bullets here. I'm not going to get in these in detail, but just to highlight a couple. Uh, first, uh, systems thinking. That means uh, addressing traditional plan elements, you know, land use, transportation, housing, not in isolation, but rather as complex systems who, which interact, and their interactions determine the form and function of an even more complex system, this community, the city as a whole. So systems thinking is, is key. And then another one I'll highlight is community engagement. Uh, and what we highlight in the report is that rapid advances in digital uh, uh, technology are really transforming the ways that citizens can be involved in the comprehensive planning process. But at the same time, you know, there's something called a digital di uh, divide, so-called, that we need to be aware of. And we're going to have to find new and different ways of reaching groups that typically have not been engaged in, uh, in planning processes before. So you'll see as I go through the standards, these and others themes here are reflected uh, in them. So let me get into what we call the uh, Comprehensive Plan Standards Framework, which is laid out in the report. Uh, again, it's designed to guide local communities in integrating sustainability into the Comprehensive Plan. It has three major uh, components, and there are best practices uh, defined for each. And I want to make a point that these components, principles, processes, and attributes, as you'll see, go beyond the substantive definition of sustainability, the triple bottom line, or whatever we would like to uh, call it, to cover all aspects of comprehensive planning process. Um, so I'm going to go through, again, these rather quickly, but I'll get in a little more detail on, on several of them to really give you a flavor. And there will be a link at the end of my presentation where you'll be able to find uh, these standards and look at them in more detail. So first, uh, the components of the framework. I mentioned uh, the three major types. It consists of six principles, two processes, and two attributes. Again, each of these has a set of best practices, which are the, uh, I would refer to as the planning action tools through which these uh, principles, processes, and attributes are implemented. I'll get to the definitions of each of these in a moment, but uh, one point is this framework is based on, we did a lot of research with, from the original task force on, of contempor contemporary and emergency, emerging practices found in leading plans and planning literature. So the principles, this is the substance of the plan, uh, normative statements of intent that underlie a plan's overall strategy, uh, meaning its goals, objectives, policy, maps, other content. And I'm going to, I'll, I'll show all six of these, but I'm going to highlight two of them in particular, livable built environment and healthy community. So this first principle, livable built environment, and I'm not going to read these, but you can see this one advances the comprehensive plan as a tool for an integrated and systems-based approach to create, creating that goal of a livable built environment. So it got, goes beyond, say, land use and transportation to cover all aspects of the built environment. Uh, to things like energy and infrastructure. I mentioned that each of these uh, principles and processes and attributes has best practices associated with them. I'll show these as an example for livable built environment, which happens to have 11 best practices. And they get in a little more detail in terms of the direction um, covering topics. You can see here again things such as transportation, land use patterns, to green building design and energy conservation. Uh, this slide I'm, I, I'm putting up only to illustrate there are 85 best practices on, on the whole, as a whole. Each of these is defined in the PAS report. And for example, this happens to be um, the, um, the livable built environment uh, 
uh, principle, best practice to co coordinate regional transportation investments with job clusters. So you can see a more detailed definition, which is in con contained in the PAS report, and again will be is available on the link that I'll provide uh, at the at the end of my presentation. Harmony with nature um, uh, principle. Uh, this one recognizes the role of the comprehensive plan in sustaining the health of the natural environment and mitigating impact of development on natural resources. I'm not going to show the best practices, but one of them, for example, is to plan for the provision and protection of green infrastructure. The third uh, principle, resilient economy, uh, means an economy that can sustain itself and adapt to changing economic conditions. For example, by uh, building reliance on local assets in the local and regional economy. Uh, principle number four, interwoven equity, calls for weaving equity into the comprehensive plan by considering who benefits uh, from policies, priorities, and exp ex expenditures. And uh, this is an example of the interrelated nature of these components. So you'll see equity as a principle, but it's not a standalone principle. You'll also see it incorporated throughout the other principles, processes, and attributes. Uh, the fifth um, principle is healthy community, uh, which recognizes the potential of the comp plan as a tool for promoting healthy community goals. And again, this illustrates the point that the principles aren't isolated from each other, uh, but they're interrelated, which thinking back to the trend I mentioned towards systems thinking and contemporary planning practice. So this principle works together with the previous ones, livable built environment, harmony with nature, resilient economy, and interwoven equity to support a, a definition I really like to uh, define the mission of public health to fulfill society's interest in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy. So I'll show you the best practices for this one. They range from active living, healthy food access, to environmental health, and equitable access to public facilities and services. Uh, the last of the six principles is, uh, is responsible regionalism, which calls for local governments to connect with planning of adjacent communities and the region as a whole in their comprehensive plans, for example, by coordinating local land use planning with regional transportation investments. Uh, move on to the next major component, the plan processes, which there are two. And these are pretty important, so I will show you the best practices for each of these. Uh, the first is authentic participation. It deals with meaningful community engagement throughout the process of preparing and also thinking about engaging the community and implementing the comprehensive plan. Um, so in terms of participation, uh, the best practices include uh, involving the community in all stages of the planning process. For example, by engaging them in scenario development and using a variety of communications channels to reach different audiences and engage them in the process. Accountable implementation, uh, we all, we, this is important to all of us, is key to developing a comprehensive plan that is sustainable in the sense that it doesn't end up being the proverbial, proverbial plan sitting on the shelf. So looking at the best practices, uh, typically this is accomplished through an implementation section of the plan that defines specific actions, priorities, uh, responsibilities, and resources to support implementation. And so uh, I want to just actually point out one of these best practices, 8.6, uh, established implementation indicators, benchmarks, and targets, is an example of how the standards are intended to function as a framework. So these standards don't prescribe what those metrics are, but call for the local community based on your planning process and what's important to set those metrics as part of the plan and the implementation program. The final component are, the, are, the, are, are what we call plan attributes. Uh, Dave Godchelk, I think, came up with the idea of calling them plan-making design standards. So these are what shape the content and characteristic of the comprehensive plan itself. And so looking at the first one, consistent content, this one addresses the basic content of the plan itself, its rationale, and then how its different components are blended together into a coordinated, compelling, in consistent comprehensive plan document. So I'll show the best practices for these. So these include uh, uh, practices such as beginning or, or conducting a strategic assessment of the issues facing the community. We suggest using a SWOT analysis uh, or the equivalent, connecting those to a strong evidence base, uh, community conditions and trends, and then a, a future vision, goals, objectives, policies, and actions that build 
logically on those issues and evidence, and they're all presented in a clearing and compelling fashion in the plan itself. Uh, the last one, coordinated characteristics. Uh, we, uh, Dave, again, I think called these the plans identifying features, its strategies and recommendations, and how they're internally and externally coordinated and communicated to different audiences in an innovative and persuasive manner. So an example of these is using uh, plan formats online and others that go beyond traditional uh, paper documents. Uh, the standards framework, and it's laid out in the PAS report, includes a score scoring system. I mean, obviously, these are qualitative uh, uh, standards and best practices, but we devised a method of, of numerically scoring them to provide a tool for measuring, say, you're looking at a comprehensive plan, how it ranks against a national benchmark. So without getting in, in, into too, any detail or too much detail, what this plan scoring system does is it results in an overall numeric score based on how the comprehensive plan addresses uh, best practices so for all those uh, components I went through, the principles, processes, and attributes. And there's definitions of scoring criteria for five categories ranging from not applicable uh, to uh, low to medium and high, and you see you get points for those. And the not applicable was an important one because one of the issues that came up as we were developing these and working with the pilot communities was, well, you know, all, all communities, you can't have a one-size-fits-all framework or system. So that not applicable actually helps in terms of whether some rural communities or others may not have certain of the conditions that some of the standards address. So the end result are three levels of achievement. Uh, we refer to them as, uh, in the PS report, as a basic or designated level, silver and silver and gold. Uh, and gold. Uh, now, where we are in this process is we're working with an advisory committee uh, um, of, of a number of representatives who were engaged in this process from the pilot community, communities and others from the beginning, evaluating one of the goals of APA leadership from the start was thinking, well, maybe we can implement a formal review and recognition program. And so we're looking at what it would take to implement that using that scoring system. And so what we will be doing is making recommendations to the APA board on how we might move forward with this program at their fall business meeting, which will be held during the policy conference in D.C. at the end of September. And based on that, we're going to, uh, with their decision, we will be moving this program forward. So my last slide here is, um, I guess you a link to, uh, to a site where you can find the, the, the standards, the best practices, and their definitions. That's up, up on top. And then I want to make actually a final um, uh, plea or request. Um, we have had a survey out for a, a few weeks now. Part of the work in evaluating this idea of a recognition program, we really want to get input from APA members on whether, whether you think that's a good idea, you know, there are issues about how you might fund this, uh, support this through funding, and sort of other questions about it. Uh, about it. So we put the survey up, and we're just getting ready to close it. Uh, actually, the official closing date is today, but we're going to leave this open till Monday. So I'm hoping that perhaps some folks on this uh, on this uh, webinar, if you're interested, can go to this link. It's a very short, brief survey. It's easy to fill out. Uh, and, and take the survey, and if you do it by Monday, you, your vote will be counted. And uh, the PDFs of, of our presentations, I believe, will be made available, and I included live links in the PDF, so just go to the last slide, you'll be able to click on it and go, uh, and go right to the survey. So I'm going to stop there, and um, now I'm going to turn it over to Patrice, I believe. Patrice, you might be muted. Okay, can everyone hear me? Am yep. I unmuted? Great. Um, hi everyone, Patrice Carroll here in Seattle. 
And I am going to talk about our planning process that's underway and how the sustaining places um, has been really helpful in during this update process. For some reason, my slide, oh, there we go. Uh, so just a, a brief snapshot of Seattle. Um, we are a fast-growing city. Uh, we're over 650,000 people now. But we're a really compact city, too, um, only 83 square miles. So um, comparatively, we have about the same population as Denver, but less than half the land area. So even though we're not the fastest growing large city in America anymore, I still like to say that we're the fastest growing large compact city. Uh, we're 50-50 in a lot of ways. Um, about our households, about half are renters, half are homeowners. Our housing stock is about half single family detached, half multifamily, and even our commuting. Right now we're kind of right on that 50-50 mark for people taking transit and people still commuting in single occupancy vehicles. Our economy is driven by advanced manufacturing, increasingly tech uh, and biotech. But we also, because of our watery location, we have a really strong maritime sector and a major container port. Uh, some of the important milestones in our comprehensive planning process, things really got going back in 1990 when the state passed the Growth Management Act. And this established a requirement for comprehensive planning and also for regions to establish growth boundaries. Um, Seattle is 100% within the regional growth boundary. We created our first plan under growth management in 1994, and we've updated it once in 2004. Um, and now we are doing the second update to the plan. Um, and the actual name of the plan is called towards a sustainable Seattle. So it's, it's no surprise that we have been very interested in the Sustaining Places initiative. One of the, uh, one of the ways that I think our plan has really uh, been sustainable was back in 1994, um, there was an overarching strategy that was captured in a phrase coined by Mayor Norm Rice, urban villages. How would Seattle grow? Seattle would grow in this network of mixed-use villages, urban centers, the largest hub urban villages, and then the least dense, the residential urban villages. And those are the, um, and those are shown here in the in this map where uh, the darkest colors are the are the densest places. And over the last 20 years, um, this strategy has actually worked pretty well. About 75% of our new housing and jobs has gone to those urban villages. Um, we're definitely going to carry this strategy forward, but as we look out for the next 20 years, how to prepare for 120,000 more people and 115,000 more jobs, we think this strategy needs some tweaking and more refinement. And this is really where sustaining places has been helpful. Um, one of the foundations of our plan that was established back in 1994 are what we call our four core values. So these are, again, these are sort of our principles. Um, and these are still resonating with people today, but we did want to recognize that our city has, um, has embarked on a, on a very robust um, race and social justice issue, so we have made some, some tweaks, and our uh, core value of social equity has really been um, expanded to really focus in on race, because that's where we see a lot of the disparities. Um, so that's been a big theme of this update. Our timeline, where we are in the process, um, we have just started releasing a lot of information this spring and summer. In May, we released a draft EIS that looked at four alternatives, and in early July, we released the first draft of the plan. Um, we're hoping that the mayor will send his recommended plan to council um, by the end of the year, and then council will take it through a legislative process in 2016. Um, <clears throat> Seattle was, uh, Seattle's plan was, was part of the early Sustaining Places work. The first um, PAS report included an evaluation of Seattle, and it, it was really favorable, but we did get a little head start in that they, they did identify some places um, for us to improve, and so, so we looked at this as part of our evaluation at the early stages of our planning process to see what areas we might want to change. 
Um, so in, in our assessment, um, we haven't gone through the exercise of scoring the plan, but I think we used the tool and the best practices really to, um, to identify where our plan strengths and weaknesses were. Um, and there is work underway in those areas for improvement. Um, and we were really looking for that kind of not present sort of policy to see where there were some gaps. I think as we move towards um, after getting feedback on our draft plan and when we're putting together the mayor's recommended plan to go to council, we'll be looking certainly to, uh, to strengthen some policy. So we'll be doing some fine tuning at that, <clears throat> at that point. <clears throat> One of our first decisions was really deciding on this plan framework. Um, as David said, there's a lot of plans now that are really moving to uh, systems or a, a more operational uh, type of organization. Um, our current plan was structured around traditional elements. Um, some are required specifically by the State Growth Management Act and, and some were elements that we decided here in Seattle to add. Um, so we did look at a lot of those best practice plans from other cities. Um, ultimately, we did decide to stay with a more traditional element structure. Um, and about half of these elements are ones that are required by the state. We did update some language and we also decided to pull out our park and open space policies into a separate park and open space element. Um, so even though we didn't mirror the sustaining places framework, um, it was a really helpful tool for us in, in discussing that very basic, what's the best way to organize our plan. Um, <clears throat> Seattle is a large city. Uh, we have a large family of long-range plans, and um, so that's always a challenge for us when um, we're looking at our comprehensive plan. How specifically should our comprehensive plan be? Um, what kinds of actions belong in our non-statutory plans, um, our transportation plans, modal plans, climate action plans? Um, so there's always a lot of tension. And I think in, in some ways we, we recognize that, that our comprehensive plan is probably going to always be a little bit less specific about implementation actions because we rely on all of these other, um, this large family of plans to, to give us direction and really like to focus on the comprehensive plan being the, the overarching guiding policies. Um, but implementation is something that has come up very much in the discussion of our update. And so we are thinking of some ways that we could perhaps have a separate document. Um, again, that wouldn't necessarily be adopted by ordinance, but something that we could use mostly to demonstrate to the community um, that the comprehensive plan really matters and it really does tie to implementation actions and, um, and it will also help us monitor the success of the plan. So that's something that's still very much underway. Uh, <clears throat> some of the challenges, I think these are challenges that, uh, that many cities are, are discussing as part of their comprehensive plans. Um, ours is particularly for fast growing cities. Um, you know, are we adding enough housing? Um, fast enough. Our housing is becoming less affordable. Uh, we want to keep our economy growing, but we want to ensure that, that everyone is benefiting from that growth um, and from the, all of the prosperity that's happening in our city. Um, so the level of growth um, as, a, as a kind of a compact built out city, um, we're, really getting to, um, we're really getting to that point um, as I said before, we're kind of like half single-family detached houses and half multifamily houses, and so we're definitely seeing that balance um, change and, and really trying to figure out how we, can, how we can get kind of more of those houses, housing types in the middle that are more compact than single-family detached houses, but perhaps, um, but perhaps not in multifamily apartments and condos. So, um, so that's, that's one of those stresses that's really coming out in our... Um, in our comprehensive plan update. Um, we also have uh, gone through another kind of rating system in Seattle, um, and that's the STAR rating. Seattle was a pilot for, uh, for that initial rating system. So uh, even though we didn't win the Super Bowl this year, we, we were designated as the, you know, officially according to the STAR system, the most sustainable city. And so we work very closely with um, with the staff here in, in the city that works on, that's really involved with the STAR program. And I think one of the things to note, one of the outcomes of, 
of the city going through this rating system and um, and the place where one of the areas where we scored the lowest was in that equity and empowerment um, practices and and that really led to a, a recommitment um, again looking kind of launching a new program around environmental justice and and looking at some of the communities that are the low-income communities that are, are going to be most impacted by climate change and sea level rise and so the rating system really led to some tangible new programs new strategies um, being discussed in the city so I think that the sustaining places uh, rating system could also lead to conclusions like that so looking forward we're, we're still as I said, we're still working on our plan, so we're going to have public discussions of the draft plan this fall. Uh, our planning commission is also going to do a very thorough review, and we think that this might be a tool to help them work their way through our draft plan, um, maybe a tool to help them organize their comments. And then we are also going to go through a legislative process next year um, with a new council. Seattle's moving to a district system, so we're, we're anticipating that there's going to be a large turnover. At least half of the council members will be new. And we're going to have to go through um, a real education process to get those council members up to date because this is going to be one of the first major le pieces of legislation that they take up um, once they're once they are seated. So, um, so I think that this could be a tool, an education tool to help really orient um, some of those new council members. And we're also taking a very close look at attributes. Um, we really want to, our, our current plan is pretty dense and heavy, and we're really looking at ways, um, as David said, using technology and graphic design and, and other ways to help people navigate the plan, uh, more plain English, so, um, so that is also going to be a big focus of the next draft of our plan. And um, that's about it. So I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, who is Matt Dugan. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can, we can hear, you. hear you. Right. Okay, so hey, I'm Matt Dugan with the City of Austin. Um, I got to work on the uh, Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. I um, actually got to work with David Rouse. He was our lead consultant for putting the plan together. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the difficulties and some of the lessons learned with comprehensive plans. Um, you know, kind of these, these things are really tough to do. You know, they're they're tough to create, they're tough to communicate, um, they're tough to implement. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through and um, share some of that stuff with, with y'all. Um, so for the city of Austin, our, uh, our plan of record before Imagine Austin was the uh, 1979 plan, uh, which a lot of great things came from that, but, um, but you know, it had been 30 years since it had been uh, looked at or updated. Uh, so in 2009, uh, we kicked off an effort to create a new comprehensive plan. Um, city Council kind of laid out three goals for us. Um, one was community engagement, one was sustainability, and one was implementation. Uh, for community engagement, they really want to kind of multiple ways for people to get involved and kind of go beyond the um, uh, the traditional participants that um, that come to these public meetings and to participate in city planning efforts or just in planning efforts or city efforts in general. Um, they want to plan plan to take a look at sustainability and figure out what that actually means for Austin, um, and then implementation. They wanted a plan that would not sit on the shelf, but something that would get would get used. Uh, so to create the plan, uh, we started off, we did a public participation workshop, figured out how people wanted to participate, um, and then we held a, uh, a number of um, uh, events to do this. So we kind of had four rounds of community-wide engagement to create the plan, um, and each one was based around a, um, a public meeting. Um, but kind of in addition to those public meetings, um, we also did some uh, some other types of events, kind of maybe a little bit more non-traditional type of outreach and engagement. Um, one of the things we really had to work on was balancing kind of the, the social with the technical uh, aspects of planning, you know, kind of the, the community engagement with the actual data um, that goes into creating these plans. Uh, a number of studies were done, surveys were done um, during the process um, to provide kind of that, that hard side, that technical side of, of input that, that was needed to create the plan. 
Uh, and then kind of these, I was talking about some of these non-traditional type events that we had. Um, it's really difficult to get uh, people even to vote in Austin. We have a, a voter turnout of, I think, less than 10%. We kind of as planners were challenged to think of, okay, what's going to make somebody come out to a meeting for uh, you know two hours on an evening or on a on a Saturday, and oh by the way, you know do that for us for two three years until we get this thing all the way through the whole the whole process. Um, so kind of looked at trying to make these uh, these meetings a lot a lot of fun, open, um, and uh, interesting. Um, so for creating the the plan and the process, um, these lessons learned. Uh, one of the biggest ones was just stay on schedule. Um, we had some friction from some um, different stakeholder groups. You know, they wanted to stop the plan. They wanted to do something else. And you know, we, at times we slowed down, but we never stopped. And uh, and I think had we stopped, then it would we would have never been able to get back going again. So definitely stay on schedule. I um, heard a lot of uh, uh, a lot of complaints about process and and data. Uh, you know, so much so that you know, kind of got to the point where when I heard people complain about process or data, that was a it was it was a red flag for uh, you know I didn't get what I wanted, um, so I want more data, I want more process. Um, so just just keep going, stay on schedule. Um, I would say less traditional outreach and more of the targeted outreach. Um, it's you know the plan is kind of built around public meetings. That's really just not a good way to get public input. Um, you know, public meetings are. Um, they're expensive. They're staff intensive. You, know, you got to design them. You got to message them. Uh, you got to um, market them and notice them and get people to come out. Um, and so we had, uh, uh, yeah. Although we did have a public meeting start the whole process, you know, some of the most effective things we did were some of the you know kind of the non-traditional targeted outreach. Um, uh, we did a thing called meeting in a box, uh, where somebody could check out the meeting materials and host their own meeting. Kind of whenever they wanted to, or wherever they wanted to, and then just kind of resubmit the results back to back to staff. Uh, what do you think called Speak Week, where we went out to um, places where they have uh, high traffic areas, and we just set up a booth or a table um, and invite people to participate right there on the spot, um, whether they're a survey or um, a dot voting exercise or, or something like that. Um, you know, those kind of outreach efforts were really, really effective and efficient. Um, another one was involve folks that will uh, actually implement the plan. Um, this is something we're seeing now. Where uh, we actually just hit our third birthday this summer, after adoption in 2012, and um, we're really seeing some dividends with the folks who helped uh, put the plan together. Um, one of the things we did was we created these working groups midway through the process on kind of seven topical area themes, and um, and those were open to the public. And then we also recruited and invited uh, staff and, and department to participate in those as well. Uh, we had a staff team, but we kind of went a little bit past that and got um, uh, a little more uh, more folks to um, help us out that worked at the city and did these things on a on a day-to-day -day basis. I think there's actually over 300 folks from city departments that um, worked through these working group processes. So it's great to have somebody, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, somebody in the community that really cares about a topic sitting next to um, somebody that might not know that much about the topic but has an interest in it. You know, sit next to a staff member who's actually a, a subject matter expert on that on that topic. Um, really provided rich uh, dialogue as well as um, content for the plan. And now, after the plan is adopted, you know, we're seeing those folks at the city really um, kind of take a leadership role and move the plan um, uh, to actually get done during implementation. You know, they have a sense of ownership um, that they were involved in creating the plan, and, and that's really helped uh, helped with us. Um, another one is uh, dialogue and aggregation. Um, this is something that, that's a challenge. It's a, you know, a couple things here is, um, you know, city leaders wanted a really high number of participants um, in the plan. You know, they wanted I think something like 15,000 people to participate in the plan, uh, but they also wanted a, uh, a diverse participation as well. Um, you know, those kind of two goals are somewhat conflicting. Um, you know, for example, you could get a high number. Of participants by emailing a, a survey. One of the things we did is we got a, a list of all the companies in Austin, large companies from our Chamber of Commerce. We'd email them out the survey. A lot of them would put back in their company newsletter and it'd go out to their employees. Um, so you have a, a company that's got maybe 2,000 employees. You know, some of them see that survey and, and start taking it and you get a big spike in, in participation. Um, but it's really not that, uh, most likely not that diverse of participants that are taking that survey. 
Uh, whereas on the other hand, you go set up a, you know, we do a meeting in a box combined with a, what we call the Speakers Bureau presentation, where we go out to a, a group, uh, you know, maybe a Catholic church, uh, 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 you know, some English speakers, some Spanish speakers, and do a presentation on, on Imagine Austin, and then uh, go through the meeting in a box exercise with them. You'd have maybe 20 to 30 people, um, you know, which is you know pretty good turnout, um, and it's great for your number of Hispanic participants. Um, but it's still just 20 to 30, 20 to 30 people. Um, and then the aggregation part of that is, um, you know, some, something that we learn is definitely you got to walk these things all the way through. You got to figure out like, okay, what are we asking? Why are we asking it? How are we actually going to comply the results once we get them? And then what are we going to do with those results? Um, something sometimes some that people maybe don't um, don't really think all that too much about, but just actually walking that, you know, each kind of uh, each phase of the process through all the way of like what are you actually going to do with that public input, and kind of be able to show people what you're asking them, why you're asking them, and how you're going to use it. Um, the other one's kind of the limits of the plan. Um, so by charter, our comprehensive plan contains ten elements. Um, and most of those kind of traditional elements, you know, land use, transportation, facilities, open space, things like that. Um, City Council added an additional four elements, um, including things like education, um, which is a difficult one because the city has absolutely no, you know, jurisdiction or governance over um, the uh, education. You know, that's run by the independent school districts here in, in Austin. And we actually have uh, 13 different school districts that were in our planning area. Um, but you know, one of the things we heard from folks is they asked them in a survey, you know, what's the most important thing to have in your in your area? You know, the number one answer was, I want a high-performing school. And the number two answer was, I want low taxes. Um, so I know personally I got a kick out of that. People wanted a really good school but not but not pay for it. But just keep in mind, kind of be able to explain to people what, are the, what can the plan actually do and what can it not do. Um, you know, I kind of feel like the, uh, you know, kind of the greatest strength of a comp plan is, is still in the, Kind of managing and coordinating land uses through uh, regulations and, and capital improvements, you know. But I do see, you know, kind of with Imagine Austin, you know, comprehensive plan really reaching out into into other areas and other fields. Uh, communication. This is a big one. Um, I wish I knew uh, a lot more about communication and messaging when the plan started. Um, I think we'd have been a lot better off. Uh, this is a picture from one of our public meetings. Um, the other thing with communication and public meeting design is we never uh, set up our public meetings where somebody could get a microphone and a soapbox. Uh, it's just not very productive. So we break up people into small uh, group tables and have them um, actually do something, produce some sort of work or, or uh, input. Um, you know, this, this communication thing is really, is, you know, it's really tough. And um, we got a lot better at it kind of uh, maybe a third of the way through the, the plan process. and. One of the big reasons for that is we have the involvement of our, our public information office. Um, you know, hired a new project manager that kind of helped with, that, with all aspects of um, kind of that role with uh, messaging, with marketing, uh, with media, with the website, um, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, one of the cool things we were able to do is um, get a local bookstore to sell our Imagine Awesome plan. Uh, and uh, every now and then we'll get a call from them. They say, hey, we need more. Uh, we sold out. We need more plans. Um, Something I never would have thought would happen is that people would want to actually go to a bookstore and buy our comprehensive plan, but that's been a, uh, it's been a pleasant surprise. Um, also, on ways of communication, here's some results of one of our uh, community meetings. Uh, I use a lot of post-it notes, a lot of these stickies. Um, one thing I would suggest with these, uh, make people use the Sharpies, not the pens, so they can put, uh, they don't write a whole paragraph or uh, report on a sticky note, but something that's a little more easy to um, interpret and capture. Um, uh, so lessons learned for this, um, it's, you know, it's really, I think it's really tough for people to get their hand around, their head around what is actually a comprehensive plan, um, and you know, why is it important, why should they care to, to participate, why should they come to these meetings, why should they fill out the survey, what's it going to mean to them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's just kind of the, the nature of these comprehensive plans, it's a, it's a very high level um, document, you know, it's visionary, it's looking out, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 years, um, you know, and some folks are just kind of working uh, month to month, so it's really hard for them to um, kind of see see that far down the road. Um, another thing with sound bites, um, you know, I believe that our, our society works really well with sound bites, unfortunately, uh, but how we're planning um, 
it's it's really it's it really doesn't work for sound bites. It's really hard to put um, your comprehensive planning into a into a sound bite. Uh, it's just it's complicated. Um, I think it was uh, earlier this year I heard Andre Juani speak and he said something about how complicated these issues and planning is. And he gave the example of when you have Detroit and you have San Francisco in the same country, you know, it's complicated. Um, another thing is multiple formats. Um, you know, I feel just receiving in different ways. We did all sorts of different things with um, uh, whether it's a flyer, uh, door hanger, you know, a website, radio, um, posters, um, sweater is all sorts of different uh, media and, and formats for how we communicated. Uh, this next one kind of was top down and bottom up approach. You know, I was talking about how we had such great staff support with uh, with the with the plan and the process and the working groups. Um, and the idea with that was, you know, each of the 30 departments in the city has a representative that was uh, assigned to participate in the plan, um, and they're supposed to go to their work group and to their department and you know provide input and then bring stuff back. And um, you know, theoretically, that trickles all the way up. Uh, but we found out on the ground that wasn't really happening. So we also kind of switched over and also did kind of a top-down approach where we'd um, get together the city manager's office, the assistant city managers, all the department directors, as well as the assistant directors, um, and got them all together and, uh, and uh, went through the draft plan with them. Um, so kind of you, know, you can have a bottom approach and then the, uh, the staff level and the kind of a top-down approach with management. You know, hopefully you get everybody in between as well. Um, Another thing is the media is uh, a lot of times they're just interested in controversy. We actually had pretty good luck with Imagine Austin with a lot of a lot of good media coverage um, uh, throughout the plan. But in general, it does seem like they're looking for something that's juicy. They're looking for something that's going to sell ads and uh, get get clicks and people to their website. So they're looking for something that's controversial. Uh, by the numbers, here's our plan. Uh, it's uh, you know it is comprehensive, 266 pages. This is a slide I put together recently because I got uh, tired of hearing people just refer to one paragraph on one page of the plan over and over again. So I think it's funny, like, well, hey, it's you know, it's not just one page; it's 266 pages. You know, there's hundreds of actions and policies, um, you know, and a map and a vision. Um, it is it is comprehensive. Um, another thing we kind of uh, are trying to do is ex just explain the difference between planning and implementation. Uh, it seems like a lot of times people think planning is zoning. Um, so just let people know, hey, you got you have a plan. That's your you know, your vision, your policies, your map, and then you got actually how to implement it. You know, your how you spend money, how you regulate development um, and programs and partnerships. So just making a clear distinction between the plan and and implementing the plan. So for Imagine Austin, we're going through five levels of implementation: um, community engagement. This is kind of ongoing engagement after the plan has been adopted. Um, We've got a speaker series where we bring in folks from around the country to talk about different topics. Uh, we do meetups um, and uh, uh, things like that. Um, second one's kind of the regulations, um, getting your code in line with with what's in your comprehensive plan. Um, for us, we're we're helped out by our city charter again, where it says you know after the comprehensive plan is adopted, all city uh, land development regulations and ordinances you know must be in compliance with the comprehensive plan. Uh, but we're going through the effort right now to revise our, our land development code, which is a, a multi-year effort as well. Um, capital investments, uh, we've got a capital planning office that helps coordinate um, all capital investment projects uh, with the different city departments, and they use Imagine Austin as a lens to kind of review and look through and uh, evaluate those, those projects. Um, Organizational alignment. Uh, this is something we're doing, trying to get outside of department silos um, and get people going, not just on the same page, but in the same direction. Uh, and this is, you know, again, something that's difficult to do. Uh, people get just really used to what they're doing, how things, how they do things, um, and just uh, so kind of getting people, you know, out of their comfort zone, um, working kind of across departments and uh, uh, to implement this thing. And then partnerships. Um, the vision that is laid out in Imagine Austin is, is way too broad for the city to achieve on its own. Um, so uh, you know, kind of have to look for partnership opportunities with uh, uh, with other folks. You know, the county, you know, nonprofits, um, educational institutions, um, you know, groups like that. They can help uh, help get the plan and, and, and move it forward. Um, and this is one we're we're, uh, we're really starting to get a lot more into here, kind of the second and third years of after adoption. Um, one thing that we ran into a bit that was great is 
uh, somebody call up, call us up or send us an email. I want to meet with us and they say, hey, I read this part of the plan. It's great. You know, I love it. Um, uh, you know, I want to help. And be like, okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm kind of like, okay, well, what what do we actually do now? What are what are actually those next steps to work with you know, this person or this group to actually move the plan forward? Um, so we're kind of doing some analysis of what partnerships look like inside the city and then trying to do some things, uh, start to try and do some things outside of the city with, uh, with different agencies. Um, for Imagine Austin, you know, we saw I had those, those uh, 231 actions. It's really hard to manage those. Uh, so our consultants helped us kind of group those um, actions into these eight priority programs. And this is kind of really the uh, the content of the plan. This is how we're organizing implementation. Um, you know, say this kind of the attributes that uh, you and David was talking about for the sustainable places. You know, get your principles, uh, get your processes, and kind of your attributes um, and kind of the content. Um, so these eight priority programs. You know, they're invest in a compact and connected Austin, uh, revise the development and regulations and procedures, uh, kind of invest in our creative economy, create a healthy Austin program. Uh, invest in our workforce, education systems, entrepreneurs, and local businesses, uh, provide household affordability throughout Austin, uh, sustainably manage our water resources, and also uh, uh, green infrastructure. So for each one of these priority program teams, there's a, there's a department lead or there's uh, multiple department leads um, that are in, in, uh, in charge of this. And then each of the, each of the teams has a project manager or what, uh, what we call a champion that's kind of responsible for that priority program. Um, those teams consist of staff from multiple departments that are involved in, uh, in, um, in carrying out the actions that are associated with that priority program. Um, and each of these priority program teams has their own work program uh, with both short-term uh, steps and ongoing steps. Um, and then each one of these has to report out on the progress that they've, uh, that they've had over that last year you know, on their actions, on their uh, programs and policies. Um, and then we take that and compile it and put that into uh, put that into our annual report. So we got the plan. It's adopted. Um, one of the things we had was in our intro chapter, kind of what it looks like moving forward. So we came up with these four, uh, you know, these four four things. We wanted to get to work. Uh, you know, we really need to set priorities. Um, we kind of agree to work together. You know, we need to commit to action and just actually, you know, and actually work on this stuff. Um, the second one is act for the whole. Uh, one of the great things about a comp plan is it really lets you kind of think big picture, kind of pulls people up from maybe a local, localized or you know, maybe a neighborhood type conflict and say, okay, yeah, what's best for this, what's best for this neighborhood, but also what's best um, citywide. Uh, you know, things like sustainability or traffic congestion, you know, or um, affordability, you know, those aren't things you can solve kind of on a uh, neighborhood by neighborhood basis. You really have to take a citywide approach to those those wicked problems. Um, you know, also for when you're acting for the whole, you just got to think holistically and also think for the less fortunate. Um, you know, Austin's a great city. We're all always on these top 10 lists, got a tremendous amount of growth. Um, but, you know, some people are being left behind. And, and I think something like, you know, 20% of our children, you know, go to bed hungry um, or without health insurance or, you know, all these other, all these other things. So it's, uh, um, you know, so I think as staff, it's really our job, it's really our role to kind of uh, speak up for those who aren't who aren't at the table. Uh, third one is expand the growth shaping toolkit. Uh, you, know, you need to use both zoning and incentives um, to implement the plan. Look to peer cities to see what they're doing. Um, see if you can focus on urban design, and then uh, and then partner up with uh, with other organizations. Um, and then the fourth one that would be measure progress and uh, and adapt. Um, this is something that you know. I think you really need to be transparent and show what you've done, so show what you haven't done, um, and just kind of do some sort of continuous improvement on on this. Uh, one of the things that we looked at when um, we're looking at how to do an annual report, I believe it was for Raleigh. Um, they had a section in their annual report that um, uh, you know, kind of looked at all the different zoning cases that were done and approved by council, and how many of them were in line with the comp plan, and how many of them were not in line with the comp plan. <laughs> and I just thought that was really a uh, great and upfront way to, uh, to make folks accountable for, uh, for implementing your comprehensive plan. And the lessons learned for implementation, 
um, you know, this is kind of an ongoing uh, uh, thing that we're learning on um, on how to do. Um, one of the things we quickly realize is that you have a the process to create the plan. Um, you know, you've got a budget and you've got uh, you've got resources to do it. Uh, then the plan gets adopted. You know, well, now you still need uh, you need funding, you need budget, and you need staff to uh, to go about and implement the plan as well. Um, uh, interdepartmental teams. Uh, this is key. Just um, uh, you know, getting people from different different departments to really start doing these things, so they they can really start trying to move the needle in the right direction, um, um, so that you can uh, actually implement what's what's in the plan. Um, leadership you definitely needs support. Um, you know, throughout the planning process as well, um, you've got to have you know at least one or two uh, elected officials that are. They're helping you keep going. Um, we had a, a three-member council committee that we'd report out to each month, um, and it was uh, it was interesting because one was kind of a uh, maybe kind of a, came from a kind of a neighborhood preservation background. Um, the other one kind of came from a um, a new urbanist kind of transit background, um, and so we'd have these report out meetings to that that council committee, and uh, you know they were kind of on opposite sides of things. And the third council member would say, "Okay, I hear you." I, I hear you, but staff just keep going. I um, mean that you know, kind of that leadership to to commit to doing the plan was was key. Um, you know, we're seeing that now as well as the plan's been adopted. Is uh, you got to have people on um, on board with it. Um, yeah, I've, I've had heard some people argue. We we recently went shifted to a um, government of uh, districts. You know, used to be we had seven at large or six at large and one one mayor at large. And we just moved this year to a um, 10 districts and one mayor at large. Um, you know, so I've heard some people say, like, well, you know, I, I didn't participate in the plan, or you know, my people didn't participate in the plan, and um, uh, you know, I, I could argue with, with them all day long that it's about the process. But really, it's kind of you know, it's almost time to, it's time to move past that and just look at, okay, yeah, you, maybe you didn't agree with the process, maybe you wanted more data, but you know, look at the content of the plan. Um, you know what's in there. Um, you know, I'm sure you can find something in there that uh, that you that you believe in or that you want to get done. Um, so it's just key to getting that that support from elected officials, from the you know, city manager's office, um, and then from community groups as well. Um, uh, you, know, you can create some sort of like friends of group for uh, for your conference of plan. Um, but that would be a really a really nice way to go. Um, the other thing is connect the dots. Uh, you know, the stuff is you know again it's kind of this visionary stuff. Um, but trying to connect, um, you know, how this stuff, uh, this visionary conference of plans, how you tie this actually to on the ground uh, stuff, um, is, is really helpful. Or to try and connect the dots with the different things people work on to uh, to the outcome. Um, you know, especially with uh, development pattern. And you know, I try and talk about development pattern as opposed to, to density. Cause it seems like uh, maybe just density is a bad word. Um, so I, you know, I, I use the development pattern when I talk about this stuff. Um, you know, Austin's a great city, like I say, but we do have some problems. We got a we got awful traffic congestion. We've got a, a household affordability problem, um, and uh, um, and your know, kind of development pattern, your know, density. It's not the solution to those problems, but it's you know it's part of the, of the solution uh, to those problems. So we're just showing people, you know, kind of how um, you know how your development pattern affects all these different things, and kind of showing the benefits of of a good development pattern. You know, what it can do for transit. Uh, you know what kind of opportunities it can provide for different housing types. Um, you know kind of how um, you know denser development uses less water, um, things like that. Just really showing people um, you know the benefits of of things. Um, I think this is also a tough one as well because yeah you know, I think it's easy to talk about these big issues and we want to solve them, but then you know kind of actually on the ground, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, you know we have a group of the city that works on housing and jobs and transit. And it's a it's a working group, and it's like you know, everybody agrees in principle what what these things are, and these are problems, and you know we need some to fix them. But then to kind of show them on the ground or show the community on the ground, okay, what are we actually talking about? It's okay, well, you know, the city said affordability is a value um, uh, that we need to that we need to have, and you know, um, and we need to provide access to jobs for people as well. Uh, but on the ground, you know, okay, well that means if you have a transit stop, well then we're gonna um, we're going to create the land use and development pattern and the zoning to support that transit stop. 
Um, and even, you know, whether that's a quarter mile or a half mile, you know, kind of what that looks like, you know, or where is the city going to invest in uh, you know, capital projects. Um, so, you know, there's going to be changes and there, and there has to be changes to actually you know, achieve these things. Um, and so I think it's important for planners to be able to, you know, to kind of connect the dots with, yeah, this is why we're going to rezone this area or, yeah, this is why we're going to, you know, invest in this infrastructure here. You know, it's because of these values and because of these, uh, these principles that we have. Uh, Illinois Measure and Report Out, we do an annual report each year to kind of show the progress on implementation. Uh, this thing, this has been a struggle as well. You're trying to figure out how do we measure this, what does it actually look like. Uh, some of the stuff won't, you won't even be able to see for results of for 5, 10, or even 20 years. Uh, you know, for example, this last year we were able to acquire uh, 49 acres in a, uh, of land in an environmentally sensitive area over uh, our aquifer. You know, so that's great, but uh, on a map, you know, however, that's you're not even gonna be able to see that show up on a map. However, if you can, if we can acquire 49 acres every year, well, you know, after eight or ten years, that will show up on the map. Um, so for kind of the measuring, reporting out, you know, really figuring out like what are those metrics? What are the things that you can actually measure? What do you have data for? You know, do you have GIS analysis that you can do stuff on? Um, and uh, you know, kind of compare it to with what um, you know what's in the plan. Um, and kind of, you know, kind of almost versus what can the city actually do. Um, you think a lot of people want the, the, the comp plan to do uh, uh, all sorts of different things since it's, uh, you know, unfortunately can't always do everything that everybody wants it to do. Uh, the last one is become a doer. Um, you know, this is what I like and, you know, not to get all preachy or, or biblical, but I think there's a, I think there's a line in the Bible, I think it's maybe in James. You know, it talks about something like it's, you know, it's not enough to merely listen to the word, uh, but you have to do what it says. Um, so, you know, your plan is done. It's adopted. You know, don't spend time arguing about the process you went through or the data you use. You know, it's time to move on to the content. You know, it's time to actually, you know, um, it's actually time to influence the plan. Um, you know, I think as planners, we're, uh, we're really good at doing plans or reports or analysis or engagement, and maybe we're not quite as good at, you know, actually doing what's in those plans. Um, so just kind of really moving on from planning to implementation. Um, if you've got your plan through adoption, then you know that's probably there's probably something in there that's pretty good. Um, so kind of you know stop talking about the plan and start actually doing something with it. You know, do what it says. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it back over to Jennifer. Okay, it's Christine here. Um, we are, thank you. We're going to go ahead and dive into some of these questions for our panelists. Um, and uh, again, everyone, you can just type those into the questions box and uh, hopefully we can, we can get to most of these. Okay, uh, our first question is for David. Um, is APA looking into working with existing uh, recognition programs like STARS Community rather than developing a new recognition program? Uh, that's an excellent question, and we're actually doing both. Uh, we did quite a bit of coordination, for example, with STAR Communities. There, there are a bunch of, for folks who, who, who may, know, may or may not know this, there's a bunch of state uh, sustainability certification systems out there. There are things like LEAD, LEAD ND, Eco Districts, and we've talked with all of them, and they all know what they're doing, uh, what we're doing. And the consensus has been that what our system does is only about the comprehensive plan. That's a niche. That's where planners lead. And some of these other systems, for example, Star Communities has a reference to comprehensive plans in it. Uh, there are some others that Minnesota has a Green Step program. But they don't get into any detail about that. And they all said it would be great if APA, APA had a system for recognizing comprehensive plans, because then we could just plug that right in and coordinate that with our system. So particularly STAR Communities, which Patrice has talked about, because that's the one that's at the uh, municipal uh, local governmental scale. We've been working with them and done webinars. And many communities like Seattle that are in star communities also have looked at and are working with our standards. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for Patrice. Um, has the city of Seattle translated the plan 
into the most common non-English languages to reach the large non-white population? Um, we have not uh, translated the plan. We are um, we have about 18% of our population currently is um, English, what we call English language learners. Um, we have done some particular community engagement during the planning update process to reach those communities. We have a program here that's called the Public Outreach and Engagement Liaison Program where the city contracts with community members to convene small group discussions to talk about um, various programs or policies that the city is considering adopting. Um, in some of our online engagement, we've been experimenting using Google Translator. Um, my understanding is, is that there's still some problems with that. It's getting better. Um, so there may be some technology solutions uh, down the road that will make some of our plans and policies more accessible to those communities. So right now, we are relying on kind of more of a focus group approach um, with using some very brief translated materials in those meetings. Okay, thanks Patrice. Um, next one is uh, for anyone. Uh, I would like to hear more from all the participants um, or panelists uh, on implementation, both how it's rated and how the pilot communities fared. Um, shall I start? Yeah. Uh, and then maybe, <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe Matt, do you want to start since you're, you're our third panelist and you've been focusing on implementation? Um, uh, sure, I can, I can say a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about implementation and maybe let you talk about the, um, the, the ratings for it. Um, let's see. Um, so you know, kind of talking about a little bit about the metrics with this, with this stuff, and how do you how do you measure this? Um, uh, in some ways, I don't think it'd be really helpful if you could have some sort of um, infographic to show, you know, this is what everybody wants, and this is what got put in the plan, and then you know, another section saying like, okay, these are the things the city can actually do. You know, we can build sidewalks, we can plant trees, we can acquire open space, um, we can build bike lanes, you know, things like that. Um, and then maybe another column, and that's where the community kind of prioritizes what they actually want the city to do. Um, you know, personally, I'm not a big fan of, of dashboards to kind of show the results of metrics, but um, you know, but in some ways, I think they work really well. Uh, you know, it's just tough to take something that's in a, a comprehensive plan that covers you know 10 or 14 elements um, that has hundreds of policies and actions, and kind of boil that down to just you know five or six or seven things. Um, but, it, but in some ways, I think it might, that might be helpful to just actually show what the city can actually do versus what the city can't do. Um, you're kind of talking about like the, the actual limits of a comprehensive plan. Um, uh, so I, I think I kind of maybe leave it at that and see what, see what David has to say about, about implementation. Yeah, I would, the one thing I would say, and you started getting at this, uh, Matt, is focus and prioritize. And, you know, one of the dangers of, uh, and I'll admit it, of a system like the comprehensive plan standards and the comprehensive plans itself, they're really extensive. So I mentioned there are 85 best, best practices. And, you know, Austin and Seattle are great, and it's great to hear from them. But I'd like to point out that, you know, our pilot communities, we, they were, there was a village of less than 1,000 folks. And some of the ones that really used these and looked at these were like Wheeling, West Virginia, 28,000 Goshen, 31,000 Rock Island, 39,000. And, you know, particularly in smaller jurisdictions, they found these useful. At the same time, you know, they had constrained resources and they found the need and set direction through the planning process of picking a few priorities and focusing on those. So uh, I think a really important, uh, I, I, again, I'll just stop there. I think uh, we all need to think as planners about focusing, prioritizing actions. That's why action schedules are really important. And then year by year, setting up your schedule, a program, you know, uh, Austin does, does this, which is great, the annual report on the comprehensive plan. We accomplished this much in the last year. 
you know, what didn't we accomplish, how have things changed, and what are the few things that we really are going to focus on that, that are important the year going forward, uh, the next year going forward. So I'll stop there. Um, I can talk a little bit about implementation, um, and, it, and it's not just going to be the plan. Um, our department is actually undergoing a reorg right now. And one of the reasons that they're doing that is because they do want planners to be more involved in the implementation. Um, how can we tie these planning policies to um, our capital improvement program? So I think that there's, um, I think it's a challenge that a lot of cities face is, is how, do we, how do we get those policies on the ground? So, so another grand experiment here in Seattle. Um, maybe we can have a future webinar in about a year and see how that's working out. OK, thank you. Uh, next question is for Matt. You mentioned 10 elements to your comprehensive plan. The city council added four. You named one, education. What are the other three? <laughs> OK, let me, um, I'm going to have to dig those. Uh, I'm gonna have to dig those up. Let me um, let me find those, and I'll get back to you. Okay. If you want to go on to the next question. Sure. Um, this is for everybody. Sustainability strategies and policies in the comp plan are high-level strategies and policies. When being implemented, levels of success vary depending on what you are dealing with on a case-by-case -case basis. A lot of those strategies and policies are hard to implement when it comes to smaller developments, infill development, and redevelopment. Can all of the panelists discuss a little more about this? So whoever would like to start. I guess I'll, I'll take a crack at this. That's a very good point. And it gets at, um, and I'm probably not going to uh, provide a very good answer for this, but it gets at the fact that you know, the standards that we developed are a framework. And everything depends upon local conditions. And again, I'll, I'll point towards, actually, let me point towards um, one of the uh, pilot uh, communities as an example. Wheeling, West Virginia, it's an old industrial uh, uh, city uh, on, on the riverfront. Constrained land, constrained development land. And most of the development land was actually in the floodplain area because it's surrounded by hill, steep slopes and hills on either side. On either side, so you know that was a real issue for them. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you exactly how they resolved that, but that was an issue that they needed to work work through and figure out what made 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 sense at the local community level based on their values and attitudes. You know, I don't think they came to a perfect solution. But it's all sort of on the road towards being more sustainable, or, or, uh, depending upon the context that you're in. And it will, again, change based on whether you're a growing city, you know, what your, 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 the attitudes of the population are, how you're ready for these types of things. So it's just going to change on a case-by-case basis. And again, I don't think that was a very good answer, but I gave it a shot. I do think it, it really depends on on the local community context and the engagement of the citizens and, and, and stakeholders and leaders, everything we've discussed so far in a webinar. Um, I can say a few words about that. As um, This is Patrice in Seattle. We are a built-out city. We have very little vacant land. We are desperately trying to hold on to as much of our industrial land as we can. Uh, we have already redeveloped all of our big public housing sites. Um, we have repurposed any um, former military bases uh, as part of our park system. So we don't have a lot of big parcels to develop. We're not building more roads. Um, are building the occasional tunnel, but, uh, but generally we are, that is how our growth is happening. It is all redevelopment and infill development. Um, one of the proposals that is going to have a very robust discussion is we're looking at those urban villages and the boundaries of those urban villages, and maybe we need to make some of those bigger. So some, that would mean that perhaps some of the single-family detached um, residential areas might be, uh, we might consider more dense development in those areas, and and so that's a way that so that's one way that we can grow, grow 
And again, we wouldn't do that everywhere, but we'd want to do that where we're making our transit investments. We're also, um, we're still building out a light rail system. And so looking at um, some of the, the, the light rail stations that are going to be coming on and how can we really increase density within a five, 10 minute walk of those light rail stations or other places where we don't have a light rail station, but we have like really, really great bus service, multiple lines going to multiple destinations. So, you know, connecting land use and transit for us is key because otherwise our congestion is just going to get worse and worse. We're, we're very constrained by the water, so we have a lot of bridges um, that are big choke points in our transportation system. So, um, so that's the point that we're at now. We really have to make some tough decisions. Okay, let me just jump in quickly because under the best practices, under that livable built environment I, I talked about, one of them is planned for infill development. There's some direction within the framework for that, and several of the others really relate to that, to that concept, sort of the way Patrice was talking about how they apply in Seattle. Weren't we waiting for Matt to come up with, did you, Matt, did you find the uh, other elements? I did. I did, yeah. So the, those four were uh, children, families, and education. Um, another one was creativity. Uh, the other was urban design. And the last was historic preservation. Um, and if you go to the Imagine Austin website and, and download the plan, um, they're on page 95. Kind of shows all, all 14 elements and then kind of how we group them with our, our building blocks. Cool. Thank you. Um, next question is, now that it's been around for a few years, how do you rate or value the lead for neighborhood development rating system? I guess this is for anybody. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there real quick. I think, um, I, th I think at first maybe they were a little bit bumpy and then when they added the um, kind of location component of that, I think that really helped out a lot. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those tough things is you know, somebody builds a structure and it gets lead certified, but you know it's out someplace where there's no, you know, nobody lives by it or nobody there's no transit to it. You're kind of like, well, how sustainable is this? But then if, if you're going to do something, if you're going to build a new structure, well then you should do it the best way you, you can. I mean, I think the same thing for kind of a neighborhood development as well. Um, you know, stuff's going to get built, um, uh, so keep that in mind. So whatever does get built, try and make it the best the best that you can. Uh, I'll just quickly add on. I think there have been some good uh, examples of, uh, of application of lead ND to sort of affordable slash mixed income uh, developments in places like Philadelphia, Baltimore, and elsewhere. And I think that's a really uh, a strong trend. So this is you know it, this isn't just about elite developer buildings or whatever. It's uh, they're, they're starting to address affordability. And I know that um, National Resource Defense Council has been working with USGBC on some of these and is really trying to promote this idea of green neighborhoods. So yeah, I think there, you know, there, there, are, positive, there are some positive trends happening with it. Um, and this is Patrice in Seattle, and I don't know, perhaps it's our proximity to Portland, but, uh, but the Echo District concept has been much stronger here than LEED and D. And if I could just add one more point to that, I, I, you know, we mentioned, I think one of the first questions was about the relationship of, the, uh, of our comp plan standards to these other rating systems. And this is an example, LEED and D eco districts are at the neighborhood scale. So we're at the citywide scale. And it kind of, they, those, you can plug LEED and D developments and they are, they, or eco districts into the comp plan system because at that neighborhood scale they're trying to accomplish a lot of the same things we're trying to accomplish through the, the comp plan standards. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Patrice or Matt. Uh, for the Seattle and Austin plans, were consultants used in putting together the comp plan or was it done by internally by staff? Go ahead, Patrice. Um, the plan is being done internally by staff. Um, we have used some consultants to help us with uh, outreach and engagement or some particular pro products, but, um, but the plan itself is 
is being led by the Department of Planning and Development and we work with a large interdepartmental team that brings expertise to those um, to those issue areas. I mean, for Austin, yes, we did have a, a consultant team, um, especially led by David Rouse at, at WRT as the, the prime uh, consultant, and then they had a team of, I think, 11 other sub-consultants um, that all sorts of different uh, kind of topic area uh, consulting work. Um, and then you know, just, just to put in a, a plug, this uh, has been a, a former consultant before I came to the city of Austin and then have worked with other consultants. Um, uh, since then, uh, just really impressed with uh, with the work they did for us. Um, with David and his team, just really, really turned out well. Yeah, and, and, and Matt, yeah, Matt, thanks for that. But just a disclaimer: it wasn't that I was moonlighting from APA? I, that was my job before I joined APA as research director. That's true, yeah, yeah. And I guess you know, and, and uh, I think our uh, a lot of people have this question as well. So go ahead and answer. But I think our uh, I think our consultant budget was something like one point um, three million. Um, and then at the, the project was over, we actually calculated that we actually use about that same amount of, of money and staff hours um, as well during the, uh, the three and a half year process. Um, and just in Austin, I think, um, I don't, you know, maybe we could have done it in house, but it's, uh, you know, we're just an interesting city. Um, so it really helps to have uh, outside perspective and expertise to, uh, uh, to help us out. Um, I, I will add that we, I also forgot to mention, we did use a consultant to help us with our EIS. Um, so that was, there was a lot of technical transportation modeling um, that was part of that. And that, you know, provides an analytical foundation for the selection of a preferred alternative. So, um, but it was also interesting that we, because equity was, was such a big issue for us, and that's a little bit outside of the framework of our you know, our State Environmental Policy Act framework. So equity doesn't necessarily get analyzed as part of that EIS process. So we actually had an, an, uh, an interdepartmental team that came up with a methodology to sort of do an equity analysis and look at and map some factors that would give us a better idea of where the risk of displacement is, um, where opportunity areas are, and that was good information that's also helping inform the selection of a preferred alternative. Okay, well, it is a little after 2.30, so I'm gonna close up shop for the day. Um, so thanks to our speakers, David Rouse, Patrice Carroll, and Matt Dugan, and Jenny Coach, if you're hanging out back there, <laughs> thanks to you and the Sustainable Communities Division. Uh, for joining us today and to all of our sponsors, of course, thank you as always. And uh, again, you can catch this recording on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. Uh, and the uh, PDF version is now up on our webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Just scroll down to the bottom and you'll see a list of all the PDFs. And um, we'll also get you the link to that survey that David was talking about We'll, uh, we'll get that out to you as well. Uh, so again, thanks everybody, and uh, we will talk to you next time.